So hi everyone. Thanks everybody for being here. It's very exciting to watch the ticker on the number of participants going up and up and up. So uh, thank you all for taking the time. Uh, some of you spending your lunch hour with me. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started um, by sharing with you my screen if I can find it. Um, where's my PowerPoint? All right, let's uh, All right, share. Hopefully you are all seeing my screen here. Yes, we are, Rhonda. Okay, perfect. So, um, welcome. So today I'm going to talk about hands-on problem-based learning where students explore and create. So um, you're essentially going to be the facilitator of these activities and the students are going to be creating and exploring and innovating. And so those are the skills that we're wanting to pull out of um, this particular talk. So. Um, Lisa gave a very nice background on me, um, but I just wanted to include a slide on who I am, what my background is, and why um, this is really important. And I, I enjoy being here with you today to share some of this. So my hometown is Fresno, California. I went to Fresno State as an undergraduate and um, majored in agricultural education. Um, my current hometown right now, I am in Indianapolis, Indiana and uh, I am the global academic relations leader. And so one of the things that has been the best part about this job is that I kind of feel like I've come full circle. So I actually was a high school teacher for a period of time before I went to graduate school um, and then started with what was Dow Agrosciences and now is Corteva Agroscience. And I'll talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, but my passion was always in that education and outreach space. So um, I want to just extend a, a very heartfelt thank you for the work that you do every day to impact students you are the reason that Corteva can be successful because we take your students that you have trained and brought to us. So um, we appreciate everything you do day in and day out for your students. Um, so on a personal note, I like to get to know people um, when I have a chance. This is a very hard uh, setting to get to know people, but I thought I'd let you get to know me a little bit. Um, so uh, some of my hobbies uh, you see here, this is some of my photography. So photography is a, a, a hobby of mine. I enjoy traveling and being out in various uh, places uh, in nature and doing wildlife and landscape photography. Uh, I am married. Um, we do have some pets. Uh, I have my dog Brandy right here. And then we have two guinea pigs as well. Um, and so I, we also enjoy traveling. So I've had a chance both um, with some of my graduate studies I did in Australia um, and then some travel with the company um, to Brazil, Canada, um, and then Mexico, and then some trips that uh, were personal vacations. So just a little bit about me and, and kind of some of the things that I enjoy so that we can get to know each other. Um, so if you haven't heard of Corteva Agriscience, I just wanted to take a really quick moment to tell you who we are and what we do. So our purpose is to enrich the lives of those who produce and those who consume, ensuring progress for generations to come. So each and every one of you are involved in the purpose of Corteva Agriscience, hence the reason that we are here. Um, so we um, really look to you, you are all consumers, but you are also all impacting that generations to come for us. So you are, are part of our purpose and part of why we do what we do. So um, the other things that, again, Corteva Agriscience is known for and what we do, we actually have three what we call platforms. Um, one is crop protection, the other is seeds and then our digital platform and all of those are within um, providing support for our customers who are farmers um, and ranchers. So um, I just wanted to share this side of what expectations we have of ourselves as Corteva, but then I also wanted to, I thought this slide was great because it's also a lot about what we look for in our future employees and a lot of what you are able to bring into the classroom and real world examples for the students in terms of, you know, we're a global company. We operate in over 130 countries. And so, you know, you have an opportunity to share global aspects and global um, impacts that your students can have on one another and get to know different um, parts of the world, where things are grown, how things are grown, um, and just different perspectives of, of people um, and their experiences in agriculture. Um, we are an innovative company. And so, you know, we have new products that are coming out. We have to be innovative and we want our students to, to share in that um, 
process too, of how do they become an innovator? How do they become an inventor? Um, partnerships are really important. Obviously you do teamwork activities um, within your, your uh, classes. And so, you know, being a partner, being a partner at the table, listening to other viewpoints and figuring out how do you work together. Um, some of the activities I'm gonna share today have that large component of uh, a team building exercises along with them. Um, and all the rest of these also apply from an integration standpoint. You know, we're gonna talk about how to integrate math and science and reading and all of the subjects into some of these activities. Um, and then, you know, the technology is always important, especially right now as we're going through this, everybody's learning how to adapt to a different setting and uh, the technology that's necessary. Uh, and then we're a relationship business. So building those relationships, um, the soft skills development, which also I'm going to talk a little bit about within these, these activities that I'm going to share with you today. So why, why do we care about these subjects? Why agriculture? Um, and why do we need students to really be informed and, and care? Um, well, our population is growing. By 2050, we'll have 9.7 billion people on the planet, and all of those people need food and nutrition. So how do we increase our food availability to the growing population so that we ensure that there's no starvation um, that happens around the world? So that's, that's a key one. Um, the other one is food demands are changing. So as the middle class changes, um, the, the types of food that they are able to invest in and get from a nutrition standpoint change. And so, you know, those demands on food are, are another piece of why we need, why agriculture is so important and these subjects are so important to bring to your students. These are global challenges. These are not something that we have solutions to all of these across the board today. Um, and so they're going to be a part of implementing how do we solve these problems. Um, and then of course land and water availability. We don't want to take more land and put it into production agriculture. We want to make what we have very, very successful, high, highly productive so that we don't have to have more land. We know we're not going to get more land or water um, easily. So how do we make the best with what we currently have? So we need innovations around all of these things. And um, students can be a part of these things now. I always tell students that, you know, you don't have to wait till you have a degree to have a great idea, right? They can do this um, now, regardless of age. They can have a great idea. They can impact their communities. Um, we just need to enable them and empower them to do so. So um, just some quick questions that I have for you. Uh, I'm going to attempt to make this a little bit interactive. Um, so uh, I can't see you all in the video, but usually I tell people, raise your hand if you want your students to care about agricultural topics. So, yes, I think that's a pretty good one that everybody can get behind. Um, do you want your students to solve real world problems? Again, raise your hand if you're wanting them to solve real world problems. I think that that's one of the things that I think when I was in the classroom, I always got asked of, why do we need to learn this? How does it really apply? And so that's one of the things that, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you today about these are really true problems that we have that we want students to think about and have solutions for. And then would you like to include soft skills in your learning outcomes? Again, I think this is something that is highly valuable to any employer, regardless of where they want to go next. Um, any career is going to need students that are highly versed in soft skills development, having good communication, being able to be part of a team, to work together, to have leadership. All of those things are, are essential in terms of success once they, also, they leave your classroom. So here's another uh, little activity for you. I wanted uh, you to be able to participate. So I want you to take these things. These are all scrambled. All of these boxes are part of the design process, but they are not in order. So I want you to just kind of jot down in your head or, or if you have a scratch piece of paper with you, you can write down um, what are the parts of the design process in order. So do we start with test and improve or do we start with identify or sharing or creating or imagining or design. And so just take a, just a minute and kind of put these six boxes in order. Okay, just give you a few more seconds to have it in your head, kind of what you think that process looks like. And then we'll go to the next slide and see if you've got it right. So, um, oops, sorry. 
So first one is to identify the problem. What is the problem that we're trying to tackle? And um, describe, you know, what it is so that we know where we're starting from. Next is to imagine, and that's where you're really looking at brainstorming all the possible solutions. So you're not saying this is a good solution, this is a bad solution, you're just saying, what are all the steps that we could take to prepare our students and, and to solve this problem? What are their answers to this big question? And then we move from imagining to, okay, now we need to narrow it down and say, okay, we've got all these great ideas, which ones do we think we can imp implement and design and diagram what a prototype might look like. So you're actually designing, okay, this is gonna be the solution to our problem. Then you create that, so you build it. Then you test and then you improve and you say, okay, what data did we collect? What did we learn from that? And then you share those results. So that's the communication piece. Within each of these steps, you can see um, pretty easily where the um, soft skills development could come into play. And so the soft skills development, you know, in brainstorming has a lot of teamwork and listening and sharing, right? So there's communication going on there, um, as well as at the end when you share out your results, right? There's another communications piece. Um, and there's teamwork throughout all of these steps. So you can incorporate those soft skills into this design process. So we're gonna talk um, again about specific examples of how to implement this. Um, so one of those activities, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna say that when we were planning on doing this in person, I had one lesson plan. Uh, when we were going virtual, I had to create, okay, how can we do this in another way? So one of the other things that I wanna share with you today is how you can modify this depending on what the fall looks like for you. Some of you may be virtual still, and this will still work. Or some of you may be back in the classroom and you may use this directly like it is, or you may want to go and do some of the lesson plans that this has been modified from. Um, so the question is, what are the essential ingredients needed to make a healthy and nutritious snack mix to sell in the school cafeteria? You can modify that if you're not at school. Um, and how would we market and sell that snack mix? So the original lesson plan was actually to create and design healthy ice pops. Um, when I was gonna do this in person, I thought uh, healthy ice pops, I don't have enough time in a session that's an hour long to freeze anything. So I was gonna change the healthy ice pops to making smoothies. And so then, you know, we could try them right then and there. So it's a much quicker activity. So you don't have to worry about freezing it and um, takes, removes one step of the process. So depending on what your scenario is, you may want to do healthy ice pops and, you know, have this over a few days of activity, or you may want to change it to smoothies, have it done in a day or two, or you may use the one that I have today to share with you because we're virtual um, and do a snack mix. So this is the big question. And so the first step is to determine what are the components of your snack mix going to be. Um, and I do have some caveats here of, you know, if you have any nut allergies, you need to be aware of those, um, as well as if you add a sweet of some sort, you know, considering students that may have a, a diabetic conditions or other health conditions that uh, just be aware of that. Dried fruit also has sometimes high sugar that you need to be aware of. Um, but you know your students and so you know what might work well, and you can modify this so that you can eliminate those. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that. So um, I'm just going to quickly try to get another little bit of interaction here. So if you could use the chat window, I listed out some of the ingredients of maybe one of my ideal um, snack mixes. But what other ideas do you have for what you might include as a category of item in your snack mix? So I'll just give you a, a quick few. It says pretzels, goldfish, popcorn, Cheerios, seeds, granola, cranberries, pumpkin seeds, dried bananas, beef jerky, dehydrated vegetables, craisins, <laughs> nice. chocolate chips, pumpkin seeds, almonds. They're going fast here. <laughs> Marshmallows. Perfect. So, so those are all great examples. And I heard some that I hadn't thought of. So whoever said the, the beef jerky, that, that's a good one to add. I hadn't thought of that one. Um, so essentially this... What I loved about this example and this activity is that um, you can do it anywhere with anyone, right? Is you can come up with some sort of mix of items. Um, so the steps that you would go through, and so here's an example of, you know, if you have a nut allergy or a um, diabetic student, 
these are just cereals and raisins. So the raisins may or may not cause an issue. Um, you would need to check, but um, it's just cereal mixes, right? So you can eliminate some of those um, things. It doesn't look maybe as an ex exciting, but uh, uh, it tastes pretty good. I made this and actually ate this one. Um, so research what goes into a healthy snack mix. That would be where you would start with your students to say, you know, hey, what kind of items? Basically just what I did with you. You just did a very, very quick brainstorming session on, okay, we're gonna make a snack mix. Let's brainstorm all the different things that we could put in that snack mix. Some may be very realistic, some like, you know, fresh fruit. Well, that might get a little messy. And if you're wanting to use a dry snack mix, should we dehydrate something, you know? So there are different things that, that you can brainstorm there um, and go through, you know, what possible things could you include? Then you start creating your recipe and saying, okay, well, what of all these different things that we just brainstormed, which ones do we want in our, our particular recipe? You can then collect those items for the recipe, create it, build it, taste it, and then get some data back from those taste tests and then improve your original design. So say maybe this one up here, you know, I don't like the ratio. I've got too many of the checks and not enough of something else. And so maybe we could add a third cereal here. And so you can improve your overall design. And then, you know, as many times as you'd like to do that cycle before you get your perfect recipe. Um, you can also consider uh, what packaging materials. So do you want to use small paper cups for them to have a sample um, and try each other so that they can give feedback to each other? Or you can keep just the same team tasting their own. So depending on how, again, complex you want to make this, you can modify it in a lot of different ways. Um, you could also put it in baggies and have it take, take them home and have their family members sample and give feedback. So that's another way to get more family learning. If you're working in an environment where you can do that and, and get family learning together, um, that's a great opportunity to make a student um, a leader in their family. So they're bringing this home and they're running this experiment with their family. It shows you know, the family what you're working on um, and encourages the entire family to get involved, which um, I know I always enjoyed doing. Uh, and so the other things that you could do is you could actually ask a nutritionist to come in and talk to your class about what is nutrition, what are healthy snacks, um, and any allergy concerns that they might need to worry about. Um, so you could do that either up front um, as before they make it. It's a nice introduction to the lesson. You could also talk to a farmer about what are the items that are grown there and what are they made of. So if you um, take a label of one of these cereals, for example, and you look at it, the first ingredient is rice. And so how do they grow rice? Where do they grow rice? You can add all of those kinds of questions um, and then contact someone that grows rice and say, can you show us a field and show us what it looks like and what is the process of growing it um, and where, where do you live? You know, all of those questions you could ask to a farmer. So um, if you are still virtual, I took some time to really consider, okay, how do we, you know, make this work? Um, if you have students that are food insecure, um, consider it sending some of the items home. So maybe they don't, they brainstorm a list and of that list, you as a classroom pick five, six ingredients and you send a little baggie of each of those home and then they can make them themselves at home. Um, and you could also ask students, you know, if they have items at home, they can use those. Um, we're trying not to encourage them to have to go to the grocery store, right? We want to keep them safe. So um, they can use items that they have at home, or you could send a little packet home um, with them. You can meet online to provide the coaching and the feedback on versions of the recipe of, you know, what have you got and, and how did, you know, what did the data look like? You could do graphs and such on that. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, you can have the family members participate in those taste tests um, to collect data and then revise according to that data. So um, this is just a, a little form that I put together on if you were actually doing a taste test um, that they could have uh, pass these out or, and have each family member sort of circle, you know, okay, from an appearance standpoint, does it look really yummy or does it maybe not look as good? Um, so I have some examples of different ones. So I'll just try to show you here. So this is a snack mix, one of the snack mixes that I have that's just basically mixed nuts. Um, and so, you know, we could look at it and say, okay, what's the appearance look like? Does this look appetizing um, when you taste it? If you taste part of it, you know, what does it taste like? Does it taste great? Um, I happen to know that from this one, this is one I have at my house. Um, to me, this one is a little too salty. So I might say, you know, the taste is acceptable, um, but for me, I would like it to be a little less salty. 
Um, and so they can make notes on, on things like that. So they can actually, you know, look at texture. Um, you know, what's the texture look like and, and feel like and taste like? How does it smell? So if you, you know, try another one, here's another version that I made um, with cereal and popcorn. And so maybe this one, you know, the aroma, uh, because I have some uh, Cheerios that are cinnamon Cheerios, might have a really yummy cinnamon smell if you like cinnamon. In fact, it does. So um, you can do an aroma or a smell uh, test as well. And then the overall acceptability, right? Of does it look like something and taste like something and the whole package is there, right? It, and it looks extremely yummy. I would buy that off of the shelf at the grocery store or you know, maybe that doesn't look as good as I might like. And so I'm going to pass on that one and maybe say it's acceptable or even unacceptable, right? That it just doesn't look very good and tasty. So this is a, a data collection sheet you can print out and use with your students. And then I wanted to really bring all of it together and say, you know, the, this activity can really be truly interdisciplinary. So you can, you know, make this anything you want it to be. So from a math standpoint, you can do ratios of actually saying, okay, how much of one cereal to the other kind of cereal did you put in there? Is it a one-to-one -one ratio? Is it a two-to-one? Did you have more raisins than cereal? You can do fractions that way. You can do measurements. So, you know, if you want to do half cup or tablespoons or any of those kinds of things, you can, um, you know, incorporate measurements and how to use uh, devices to do measurements. You could talk about serving size. What is a serving size? And how many calories are those? So if you're teaching in upper grade levels, I would say, you know, you can get into more details around, you know, what is a calorie content? How do we decide what that is? How do they measure that? Um, and then obviously data collection and analysis. You can do graphs, uh, you can do charts, um, and then you can also calculate the cost. What is the cost of my finished trail mix product that I have here? So here's, here's another one that I made. Um, you know, so if I take the cost of the raisins and the pineapple and the cashews and the M&Ms, um, you know, and put it into my, my mixture, what did it cost me? And then um, you can calculate what a cost per serving could be. Um, in terms of agriculture, bringing agricultural topics to um, this activity, where do each of those ingredients come from? I mentioned that earlier, of look at the back of the box on the cereal and say, okay, this is rice or this is wheat, or, um, you know, we have almonds in this, where are almonds grown? Uh, when are they grown and where are they grown and how are they grown, right? So you have all those questions that you can open up to have the agricultural experience with each of the ingredients that are within their trail mix. Um, from an art standpoint, you can create advertisements of, hey, we have this new product and, that we're launching in the marketplace. Um, you know, it's, it's, these are all the characteristics. Here's why you really want to buy it and, and eat it. Um, you can create packaging, you know, what is it going to look like? Um, when you put it in a package, you know, they can design their own baggies per se. Um, and then from a reading and writing standpoint, um, you're keeping lab notebooks. So it's really important to, for a scientist uh, to have a lab notebook so that somebody can repeat it. So what if you made your recipe and your friend um, wants to know how to make it? Well, you can't just tell them that, oh, well, I use almonds and uh, raisins and pineapple. And their version is going to look very different if you don't tell them how much of each of those you used and in, or, you know, what sort of percentages or what sort of ratios, um, you know, so you can go back to the math, but they also need to, to be writing that in their notebooks. They also could write out the recipe, right? You can write observations from the tastings. So, you know, I mentioned that one of these for me was salty, right? So you can write out observations as people are describing their experience with their tasting. You can write all those down. You can create a marketing plan. So what would you do to use this activity? Um, write a review of someone else's recipe. Um, so you can have them share the recipe, um, make somebody else's, and then write a review of that recipe and say, you know, these are the things that I really liked. These are the things that maybe I would improve. Um, and then they can also read other recipes. And so you could share those reviews and they could read those. So those are just some ways to make it very interdisciplinary um, and have a lot of different subjects that are covered in this one activity. Um, some additional questions, um, if you wanted to have a discussion, were what are some of the considerations that you made in developing your recipe? So, you know, what was the thought process behind it? So some reflection a little bit. Um, what were the main ingredients in those food items and where did they come from? 
what is the importance of documenting your recipe? Why did you need to be very careful in your lab notebook to write all that down? What if you didn't? What would the consequences be to that? Um, how does building a recipe relate to healthy nutrition and agriculture? What does that mean? What, what are the links there? So making that a very tight linkage between those two things. So those are some additional questions that you can um, discuss throughout these. So I'm gonna actually pause there and see if there were any questions based on this activity. Let's see some Q&A. Um, one question, Rhonda, is would you give students guidelines for a healthy, nutritious snack? Is taste just a criteria for evaluation? In other words, how about a student that gets an A on taste because their trail mix is all M&Ms? <laughs> Fails on the health aspect, which was the original question problem, seems like they would need requirements for health and taste. Yeah, so you could add um, onto that sheet of this one, um, you could put, you know, health, right? And, and say that it's extremely healthy or not at all healthy, right? And so I would suspect that most students um, would be somewhere in the in-between, right? They don't want it completely healthy because then you lose some of the taste. Um, but then that, that could also play into the overall acceptance. So I think that's a very valid thing to add here is the health part of it, um, that you can't have all one ingredient, right? That, that there needs to be some additional thought behind that healthy piece and, and emphasize the health and the taste. Good point. Yes, and I just want to make sure everybody knows we will be making Rhonda's PowerPoint and, and the slides with these charts available to you to registrants afterwards. So uh, somebody else had a comment. Great ideas. Even with COVID, maybe the kids could take home a copy of the recipe and try their classmates' recipes and then come back and share so it would be safe. So yeah, that's a great idea. Good idea on, on that. Yeah, that's one of the things I love about working with educators is you all know exactly how to modify these and make it even better than what, this is just a starting point. Um, you can take it, run with it any which direction um, that you'd like. And I, this is, like I said, one of the things that I tried really hard to do is say, how can we use it in a virtual setting as well as maybe in a classroom so that it is available to anyone um, and, and more broadly. So. Other questions before I go on to the next topic. Uh, Maura Berman wanted to know if you could talk a little more about the connection to agriculture. So it does, yeah. on the end it seems obvious, but it's on the other, it doesn't, so. Yeah, so um, most of the, well, all of the ingredients, every food item relates back to agriculture in some way, right? And so um, in my mind, anytime you're talking about food, you're talking about agriculture. Um, I know maybe that's uh, me taking that for granted, um, but it's, it's true. And so any of the items that you have, you know, from the popcorn um, to the cereal, all has ingredients that started in agriculture and started in a field somewhere. And so all you have to do, and I wish I had one, but I did not bring a label. I'm sorry, I should have. Um, but look at the back of like a cereal box label. And they're in, if you look at the ingredients list, um, you will find things like you know, or this is a rice cereal, or this is a wheat cereal, or this is a, you know, and so the connection there is, that is what is making you know, the cereal. The cereal is composed of wheat and rice products, or, um, you know, almonds. Almonds are grown on a tree, and so those aren't processed, right? So the cereal is processed. You take a food ingredient, and you make it into cereal. Um, so you take a crop, it becomes cereal. Um, whereas the nuts are all directly, that is the product that they harvest. Now there is some processing that goes into, you know, shelling them and getting them ready for your trail mix recipe. But um, basically that is the item that grew on the tree. Um, you maybe had to shell it. Um, a lot of the nuts you have to shell. And so, you know, that's, that's the direct link is food is agriculture. Hopefully I answered that. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and um, keep going and we'll have another time for questions um, just because I wanna get through um, some of the other activities that I have. So um, just as a picture, and again, you can use the chat. Tell me what these are. What is it? What do you see? Seeds, seeds, seeds. Seeds, uh, seeds, seeds. <laughs> yes. 
perfect. You all okay. got it okay. right. <laughs> These are seeds. These are seeds of various sorts. Um, so for this activity, I'm actually going to, basically you're gonna match the seed and the fruit or vegetable, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second um, to go back to the video of just me. And I'm going to show you some seeds. And again, you can use the chat window to try to determine, hopefully you can see that. It's pretty small, but um, this is a seed. What do you think it might be a seed of? Uh, P is what a couple of people have said. No, not. Yeah, pea, soybean, corn, beans, hazelnut. Nope. Corn, I'm cherry, sorry. cherry, cherry. Yeah, there we go. We got it. Cherry. Cherries. Cherries. So this is a cherry and this is the cherry seed. So, um, so you can do this matching activity. You can actually pull out a bunch of seeds from a, a variety of fruits and vegetables. We'll do a couple more here. What about this one? So this, this is actually the seed. Uh, sorry. Peach. A lot of people are saying peach. Yep, so that is our peach. So I have the fruit here. So basically for this activity, you go to the grocery store, you wander around in the produce aisle for a little while and you pick up a variety of fruits and seeds. This one's gonna be really easy because I, the seeds are too small for me to actually pull out. So if I was in a classroom, I would pull the seeds out of this um, and show you just the seeds. Um, if I was doing this virtually and I had a microscope um, adaption that I could then view on the computer, I would pull that out, put them under the scope. Um, so just so you know. Um, so what are these? Kiwi. Yes, cute. Strawberry, banana. <laughs> so these uh, little black dots around here, those are the seeds. And so, like I said, if I were to um, be doing this in a setting where I had students in class, I'd pull those black little seeds out um, and then I would show them just the seeds and then I would show them the kiwi. So this is the kiwi. Um, so those seeds make this fruit. So making that connection again of, you know, this is the, the part of the seed and the plant um, that we don't necessarily eat. So we don't always eat the seeds, sometimes we do. Um, so like the nuts from the previous example, um, we eat. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, this one I didn't wanna cut open too early because I'm planning on eating it for lunch and I didn't want it to be all brown. So that might give you a hint as to what I'm cutting into. So I'll take prior guesses, sorry, it's taking me a minute. Okay, some people are saying apple, avocado, banana. Ah. You already got it. Ah, yes. <laughs> so avocado, yes. So you can actually take this seed out. Um, if you haven't tried to grow an avocado, they're pretty easy to grow. So you can actually take this seed out, um, wash it off, and then put some toothpicks in it and sit it just barely on top of a glass. Um, just the seed, of course, take the avocado out. Um, so that the water level comes about just about a third or even less um, touching the bottom and uh, balance it on toothpicks in the water glass and it will root and then it'll eventually um, become a, a tree. Um, so it takes a very long time for it to become a tree that will produce the fruit, um, but you will be able to see and watch uh, the growth of that. So a lot of these things can be propagated um, in your classroom if you'd like. So that's a quick and easy one. Again, all you have to do is take a trip through the grocery store and pick up a bunch of varieties. I brought an apple with me, but I'm not gonna cut it open because I feel like you get the idea at this point. Um, so, you know, you cut them open, you take the seeds out, you basically say, what do you think these seeds are? Um, and then you can either, depending on the age level you have, you can have one table or pl uh, plate of seeds and then another of the actual fruit. And so they can see and try to match them. So it's just a matching game. Um, if you have older students, you can say, okay, we're going to create a hypothesis. What do you think the fruit is? And don't show them the fruit initially. And then, you know, use that as kind of the big reveal. And so um, each of those are ways to go about um, looking into those. Okay. So let me share my screen again, get back to the PowerPoint. So essentially that's the match, um, a fruit or vegetable to the seeds. Seeds are common, you know, you can talk about the wide variety of um, shapes and sizes of those seeds. So 
Hey, if I can get my, okay. So this is one of the activities that again, you know, name the seed so you can have them fill this all in of what kind of seed they think it is, what it's from. So, you know, we all guessed the avocado because we saw the avocado part. Um, what color is it? You know, you can actually give it a shape so it's spherical. Um, and then you can have them measure it. Um, I didn't actually get a plum um, and I didn't measure my cherry before I had to submit the presentation. So uh, those are missing for me because I was trying to measure things. Um, oh, and I forgot to show you maple seeds are another one um, that you can I'm gonna just stop sharing uh, because they're really interesting. So they have a very different shape, right? So they're very irregular. The actual seed that's inside this is very small. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see that. So that's pretty small. Um, so if you look at this, this is inside just the tip here where it's kind of rounded. This is the seed that's actually inside there. This is what makes it distribute. Um, so you can talk about um, how plants, you know, shed their, um, spread their seeds so they can plant and root in other places. So maple seeds are a good one to just pick up outside when you're, when you're out sometime. Um, so I'll go back and share my screen. So um, yeah, so that's the maple seed. You know, it's got an irregular shape, it's tan. Um, and then there are those wings present um, unless you actually peel it apart and they're pretty small. So, um, so you can do that with the seeds, but then you can also make this characteristic and have them fill this out for the fruit itself. And so you can do one for the seeds, but then you can also do one for the fruit. You know, so what does that fruit look like? Is it, you know, what color is it? What shape is it? Um, again, I hadn't, I bought these all yesterday and I had to turn in my presentation yesterday. So I didn't actually measure everything out, um, but they can, you know, write in and you can do inches or centimeters or, or whatever um, math topic and measurements you're working on. Um, you could have them weigh it. Um, so you could do weights if you wanted to here and uh, include a math lesson. And then any special characteristics that they note. So, you know, the, the avocado is kind of a bumpy um, uh, skin on it, right? But it's smooth on the inside. Um, so you could do inside and outside characteristics if you wanted to for a lot of these things. Um, so again, you know, you can modify these in any way you see um, fit for what your goals are for your class. So just wanted to point out that these are two of 10 lesson plans that we worked on with the National Science Teaching Association. So the Designing Healthy Ice Pops is where I basically started with the idea for the trail mix activity that we did. Um, and that I modified for the trail mix part. Um, and then the other one was the Secret of Seeds which is this one, um, but these are all available. And again, you'll have the slides to be able to access and they're available at the NSTA site or at Corteva's site. Um, so either way, we'll, we'll work to get you to these um, and you can download them and use them. They also, I just actually, I'm gonna click over to one of these just to show you real quick um, that they do have the Next Generation Science Standards uh, linkage to these. So if you're wondering, okay, does this meet my expectations for what I need to teach um, for the Next Generation Science Standards, you can actually look at this and it has all of the standards that that particular lesson meets. So this is the one for um, the seeds, I believe. Nope, this is the Healthy Ice Pop one. Um, so the whole lesson plan is here just so that you can kind of see what's included. So it gives you kind of the time frame that you could use. We made, I made it much faster for um, this activity. Um, you can modify it um, and, you know, the different weeks that they suggested what you do. This is, again, if you're making ice pops because you need some time to freeze them and make them. Um, a permission slip um, to get volunteer help. If you want to do the healthy ice pops, you can send that home to get volunteers. Um, what you need and who's bringing what, rankings of which one that they liked the best when they do the taste test of everyone else's in the classroom, and then the actual sort of here's the description of what this particular classroom did um, and how it worked for them, and then the linkages to the Next Generation Science Standards. So, um, so just to give you an idea, that's how all of those 10 lesson plans are, are set up is in that fashion. Okay, questions there. Any quick questions with that one? Okay, let me see. We do have some questions in the Q&A box, okay? okay? Let's see. What grade level would you gear this to? And I believe they're referring to your PowerPoint. Yeah, so um, 
I would say different ages, depending on how in depth you'd like to go, right? So um, the Designing Healthy Ice Pop one was designed for third through fifth grade. Um, I would say that this activity for um, the making the, um, the snack mix could be anywhere from, you know, second through probably even sixth, seventh or eighth if you want to take it into the, the higher levels of thinking, right? Of that innovation, that design, walking through. The thing that I think is, is exciting about this particular activity is that you can actually build it and look like this is how a company gets a product. You start with an idea, we wanna make a healthy snack mix. And then you walk it through the steps of how do you make that? How do you market that? How do you sell that? How, you know, all the different processes that, that goes through. Um, so you could take it up into the um, upper age levels. Um, if I was doing this even in high school, you know, I would expect them to have very, very detailed written descriptions of their recipes, of what went in it, how much, all of the measurements. Um, so that they could repeat it very easily um, and then basically turn it into a marketing kind of campaign and as well as, you know, knowing how are you going to source those products. So if you're going to have cashews in there, where are your cashews going to come from, right? So are you going to get those from here in the U.S.? Where are they grown in the U.S.? What are the costs involved in shipping? All those kinds of things. So I think you can modify it for a lot of different age levels, um, depending on what you want to do and what you're wanting to accomplish. Um, but the, the Healthy Ice Pops one is designed for third to fifth grade. Um, the Secret of Seeds one is um, younger grade levels than that, um, just because it's kind of that matching of what is a seed um, and you can grow a seed. Yeah, we had several people say, let's see, come on that you could do the seed match with even kindergartners, but you could yeah. extend some of these activities into the high school grades. Um, and Denise Dordson said there's great seed lessons on the, the National Ag in the Classroom Matrix too. Yep, that, this one is also included in the matrix. Yeah, and let's see. Also, somebody wanted to know if anybody's ever tried to plant apple seeds that our students always wanna do that, but they've had trouble planting successfully planting apple seeds. So I don't know if you yeah. can do that or not, Rhonda, but. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I have not tried personally. Um, a lot of apples are grafted, so that might be why you're having trouble. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if those would work, because um, like I said, a lot of apples are grafted trees, so I don't. Yeah, and I, if anybody has any experience with that, just put it in the chat box there. Some other um, Q&A questions. Um, yes, the presentation and video will be made available to you. Uh, any lessons that could have a connection to social studies? Yeah, so um, a lot of these, again, where does that food grown um, can have an impact on even looking at, you know, what cultures use that um, food primarily, where did it start from? So just because it's grown here in the U.S. doesn't mean that it was a crop that started and is native here to the U.S. So you could include kind of a social studies geography lessons um, into that of saying, you know, where did these things really originate? Um, where did they come from uh, versus where are they grown? So you could even go deeper into that. Um, you know, and there are a lot of, you know, food has been historically uh, involved in a lot of different processes of um, trade routes. You can talk about trade routes and why things were established the way they were um, and or are um, because of, you know, trying to get production food. Um, spices are another one that you can follow the spice routes um, over time and, and include a history lesson there as well. So there's a lot of different things that you can do potentially there. Um, so. I'm gonna go ahead and go on. Keep your questions coming. I'm gonna try to get through the last little bit of my presentation and then we'll all take as many questions as you have until I run out of time and you guys have to go. Um, so the final one I wanted to share with you is purpleplow.org. And this one is really a uh, project-based learning exercise where students are given a large challenge question like I started the presentation with to solve. They create an example um, and solution they submit that and then there are prizes so they can win a 3D printer um, with gift cards to buy um, supplies for their 3D printer. So um, 
it's usually a group of students, but they've opened it up now um, because of COVID and um, knowing that more students are working, you know, independently, they've opened that up now. So um, the Purple Plow has two different um, activities that you can do. The challenges, which are the ones that are bi-yearly design challenges that have um, contests. So these are geared for fifth through 12th grade. Um, and then the puzzlers, which are shorter hands-on activities that can be completed in a typical um, classroom time frame, and um, they go along with the challenge subjects. So the subjects are similar, but uh, these are shorter hands-on activities that you can do independently of the challenge. So um, the current one is go with the flow, and that is all about runoff in rural and urban areas. So how does runoff impact our water quality and our streams and our rivers? Um, and so the deadline for that is coming up. You've got about a month, um, a little over a month, I think. Um, nope, a month exactly um, to complete this if you'd like to participate in the current one. Um, and you can go to the challenge page and see the examples there of what that looks like. So I'm just gonna click on that real quick and share with you, um, if it comes up, yep, what is here. So tells you how long you have to go. Here's where to go to submit. Here's the challenge rationale of, you know, where does water come from? How does it flow? Um, and what becomes runoff? What is runoff? There's a video here that shows that. Um, here's the, you know, what the challenge is so that they kind of have that background knowledge of what is that? What does that mean? What are the challenges? What are the problems with runoff? And then this is what their solution must address and ways to address it. Um, then what I really want to show you is these guides down here. Um, and so there's a student guide, there's a challenge guide, there's an educator guide, um, lesson packets, the rubric that goes along with it, and some reflection sheets. So all of these are here for you, so you'll know exactly what the judges are looking for in the, the, the problem challenge, and um, the resources are all here. So just wanted to point that out really quickly um, so that you knew, basically, it's, it's one-stop shop for implementing one of these challenges. Um, the puzzlers are shorter time frame, like I said, um, that go along with the challenge. So the current challenge about runoff, this one's called saving our dead zones and it's all about a public service announcement. Um, so they could create a advertisement campaign. They could create a video campaign that says, hey, here's why this is important and what we you know, should do about it. And so, um, you know, this wouldn't take students very long. Um, you can incorporate a variety of different subjects into that. Um, it does have, again, all of these are aligned to the Next Generation Science Standards um, connections. So that information is on all of these for you um, if you're interested in those. And these are also available on that same website. Um, just look up the puzzlers versus the challenges. And there are a wide variety of topics that have been done. So the current topic I just shared with you, but these are also all available on um, the website to do. So um, just very quickly, H2 Grow is around um, hydroponics and aquaculture. Um, protecting pollinators is, is just that, of how do you protect and, and provide pollinator um, habitats. Um, growing your community is about food security in your local community. Saving the soil is about how do you design um, something to uh, preserve topsoil, um, so to prevent erosion. Um, room to grow is thinking about, you know, how do we grow more food with less land availability? So, um, you know, is there vertical gardening, indoor gardening, those kinds of things um, that they could create and think of. Um, farm the food truck, and um, when you get the presentation, I have links to all of these, so you can just click to go directly to that one. Um, farm to food truck is building a food truck and that allows people to know where did their food come from and what has made these recipes. So similar to our snack mix mix um, where you use the, okay, where did the, these ingredients come from? Uh, growing green is about energy efficiency. So being um, using green energy and then the cattle ranch riddle is designing a sustainable cattle ranch. Um, so there's a wide variety of topics here. They are, these are true global challenges that we have within agriculture. These are all things that we consider um, on a fairly regular basis of how do we provide um, more food for the growing population and protect the, the environment that we have today. And so just quickly, I did put a link to all of those resources that I've talked about um, and included the searchable database um, from the Ag in the Classroom matrix. So these are listed there as well. 
So with that, I am happy to take your questions. And if you don't have questions, I have questions for you. But if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those first. Great. Um, you just talked about where to find the links, right? Um, this person just asked. And questions. Uh, yes, the presentation and recording will be made available to you. We will send links to it and to everyone who registered in the next two weeks. Let's see. You can modify these lessons for your class. Are the puzzlers appropriate for fifth through 12th grade? Yes. Are they appropriate for younger students, K through three? Uh, I think some of them you could modify um, to, to work in some of those younger age levels. Um, they were not initially designed for that age group, um, but you could certainly, you know, take a look. Some of them are um, design principles of building um, like a structure. So you could do something similar um, where they kind of tinker a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, you could modify them. It might take a little bit more effort than what they're originally designed for. And then uh, these activities, do you know what the time frame is, Rhonda, uh, when they open? They, they make these available periodically throughout the school year. I know that, and they are free. Yeah, so um, the challenges, there's two a year. Um, so there's a spring challenge and a fall challenge, typically. Uh, the one that's going through July is the spring challenge. They extended it um, because of COVID, because they knew some students had started, but then it was going to take students longer because now they don't have, um, you know, school time necessarily to meet with their team or to do it. Um, and they also changed it so they knew, you know, that, hey, these team things might not be so easy, so individuals um, can also apply. Um, so they're, they're working through some of that this summer. Um, and so I suspect that the fall one will also be similar. Um, and I think we're almost at a point where, you know, these have been only out for a year or two. And so you might see some of those um, recycling back through as one of the competition ones um, for the chance to be, to win the, pr the printer. Someone asked, are we legally allowed to use all of these resources in our classrooms? Yes, please do. Please do, yes. Over and over and over again. <laughs> uh, Purple Plow website again, is it purpleplow.org? Uh, let's see, background is provided, or what background is provided in the Purple Plow challenges? Can urban students jump in easily? Absolutely. They are designed for anyone. You do not have to. In fact, most of the um, students that have been entering are urban students. Um, and you absolutely do not need to have farm background or, or have access to a farm to do any of these activities. So um, I know that, you know, the, um, so I'm an entomologist. So the pollinators one was very close and near and dear to my heart. So I'll give that example um, where an urban school district um, was participating and um, their approach to the challenge was, well, people don't know about the importance of pollinators. So they actually designed a education campaign to go out into their community and talk about pollinators and why they were important and um, to talk about what the habitats are of them and then had flowers planted in, in pots around um, their neighborhood. Um, so absolutely, these can be done. And again, the students come up with a challenge, uh, with the solution. So it should be a solution that's for their, their community and their environment. Um, and so all of these can be done in that way. Great. Are there any other questions for Rhonda? I just put up my contact information. So if there are follow-up questions, um, feel free to email me. I'm happy to connect with you. Um, and just wanna say a quick thank you, um, but I'm happy to spend the next couple of minutes talking through um, other questions, or um, I'd love to hear from you too on um, how you might use some of these things and what you're thinking, um, if these are useful to you um, and how you might use them or modify them. I've been getting a lot of questions about professional development and the videos and presentations for all of these sessions, Ron is included. We will make available a link to the videos, a link to the PowerPoints, and a link to a certificate that you will be able to download, but give us about two weeks to have all of these videos edited and, and prepared and get organized. So yes, we will have all of those things made available to you.
Okay, well, if that is, if there aren't any more questions, let me check the Q&A real quick. Uh, see if we've got any new ones. But Rhonda, you did a fabulous, fabulous job. You really made it interactive. Um, which everybody appreciates. I tried. Um, <laughs> and I, I absolutely know that it is not easy these days. Um, it took me a little bit of time to say, okay, how can I have stuff to hold up? And I don't know, hopefully you were seeing the trail mix when I said here, you can see the trail mix. I don't know if you could. Could you guys see that? Um, so I'll hold this up right now so you can see what they look like. So this one's the cereal one. It's got cereal, popcorn, um, Cheerios, and um, some raisins and cherries, dried raisins and cherries. This is the one that I was saying was a little too salty for my taste. Um, so this one is just a deluxe mixed nuts kind of um, cashews, almonds, uh, walnuts, uh, macadamia nuts. And then this is the variety that I make for myself. So you'll see I'm, I'm much like the kids. It's got to have more chocolate in it. <laughs> um, so dried pineapple, uh, cashews, raisins, cherries, almonds, um, and then some M&Ms because, you know, Gotta have a little question before we close. Um, someone did ask, do you expect any COVID related food lessons such as shortages of meat and, uh, or other products? And I know Deb Smealmaker, who is our lesson development specialist has been participating in this workshop. So um, I'm sure that's something that her, she and her team are noodling. So good question though. I'm sure. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I am sure that uh, supply chain um, activities are probably something that will be coming out of this because I think people um, don't necessarily know how those supply chains are connected. Um, and so I know we had a lot of discussions around um, when people were seeing the pictures of food being dumped, right? And not understanding like that, that food is needed, right? People, there's no food on the grocery store. Why is that? Um, and so, you know, the transportation of that and the cost of transportation of that was a big discussion of, you know, yeah, it makes sense if somebody can come to that farm and get that food and, and redistribute it, perfect. But um, what are the costs to harvest? What are the costs involved in shipping? Um, and what is the return if they can't sell it anywhere, right? If no one's going to, and a lot of these, this food was grown for restaurants, right? So they had the supply chain continuing for uh, the grocery stores because that was set up, that was continuing. It was the food that was being bought in bulk and not packaged appropriately for grocery stores. So, you know, they were delivering a bin of fruit instead of the little clamshell things that we all buy in the grocery store. So it's not as easy as people might think to say, okay, I'm going to take this bulk giant bin of cucumbers and then just redistribute them or, you know, more likely berries. Let's use berries because those are the ones that you typically get in a clamshell. Um, you know, you can't just put a big bin and say, okay, pick out however many pounds of berries you want. Um, that's not how we are typically um, packaging those. So those are some of the things that I suspect will be coming more into conversations. Um, and if that's a, a need, I'd love to hear about that. Um, very good. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda. Bravo. Thanks, very everyone. Good, very well done. And thank you for everyone who participated today. We had a record 845 participants. So wow. appreciate it. You made me feel good. Thank you all. <laughs> and our next session is at 1.30, and that's about a, a soybean card. So uh, can I for that. Can I just answer one question that I saw pop up? Yes, I think it is cheaper to buy in bulk. Um, so buy a big giant thing of popcorn, a big giant thing of cereal, than it is to buy the pre-mixed um, uh, trail mixes. Ah, good, very good. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.